uh, in your business. Uh, angel investors and venture capitalists would like to uh, make significant progress in looking at your company before they're, they, they consider signing an NDA. So they will probably be uh, significantly through due diligence before they uh, might consider an NDA. If they then decide um, they must see the software code or talk to the patent attorney or understand the chemistry of the secret sauce uh, or uh, whatever the confidentiality, confidential information is, they will then decide if uh, they want to sign, sign a non-disclosure agreement and see that information. But So entrepreneurs, create your business plans without the secret sauce, without the confidential information, and do not send an NDA to uh, investors before, as you're sending your business plan. When I receive an email that, said, that has an NDA attached, um, or I receive a business plan and the first page is an NDA, I just return the email. Sorry, uh, investors don't sign NDAs and uh, let the entrepreneur deal with it. So it's, it's an issue that entrepreneurs need to be aware of. Now, why wouldn't I sign an NDA? Well, I probably have been exposed to more than a thousand business plans in the last two years. Can you imagine what my filing cabinet would look like uh, with a thousand non-disclosure agreements in a four-drawer filing cabinet? It's doubtful I could breathe or get out of bed in the morning without violating one of those agreements. So, so what's an entrepreneur to do? Do some due diligence on your investors. Find some of the people they've invested in and ask them, is this guy a trustworthy guy? If he's not, don't send them the business plan. Uh, if he is, uh, try to go secure investment from them. So uh, I always encourage entrepreneurs to do due diligence on their investors, just like I encourage investors to do due diligence on their entrepreneurs. Now, lifestyle companies tend to be small, uh, self-funded enterprises, many times in the service business. Uh, and in these ventures, the CEO tends to own 100% of the stock. Um, he can exit by giving the business to his or her children, uh, or selling it, or just shutting it down at the end of uh, his career. Uh, and these are not the kinds of companies that angels invest in. We're funding high growth companies, companies that need investors capital to grow, uh, we hope the exit strategy is defined at the time we make our investment. Um, and we are expecting to work with the entrepreneur to build great wealth uh, by building a highly successful, a highly valuable enterprise. So what do, yes sir? Sorry, if you go back on the last line, what, would you ever like to look at more on what that does mean for Okay, you? so. If you're running your own company and you have, the company has enough uh, cash flow for you to uh, take a salary of a half a million pounds per year out of the company, what's to keep you from doing it? You own 100% of the company. If you're running a high growth company that's funded by investors, we're going to want you to keep your salary <coughs> in line with, uh, with the size of similar companies, not to, not to take lots of cash out of the company. We want to keep the cash in the company to allow the company to grow. Now, does that mean that you will be eating uh, beans out of a can until you exit? No. You may eat beans out of, your can, out of a can until you have positive cash flow uh, because we when the company is burning investor cash, uh, we want everybody to be bootstrapping the company. But once the company is growing and has earnings and then we, has revenues, then we would like the salary of the entrepreneur to reflect the salary of CEOs of similar kinds and sizes of companies, but not as much as the company can afford. So we're building wealth in high growth companies uh, with the entrepreneur 
And in lifestyle companies, the sky's the limit as far as what entrepreneurs can take out of their own companies. It's their company. So what do we look for in deals? Well, it usually comes as a big shock to entrepreneurs that the, the overall evaluation of the company that we're looking at that it's not 95% product and technology and 5% everything else. What this tells you is that investors bet on the jockey, not on the horse. We're looking for a team that can take this company uh, to significant valuation. And there, but there are, and there are many important components of that. The management team, the scalability of the company, the product and the technology, the sales and marketing channels, the competitive environment, uh, et cetera. All of these are critical components. Now, there are those who come to me and say, I don't like these ratios, to whom I say, okay, well, change the ratios a little bit. But don't think that I'm going to invest in your company just because you have a big patent portfolio. I'm not, because I'm betting on the, I'm betting on the jockey. We've got to have... Uh, some something we've got to have a team to run this company. Let me uh, pause and tell you a little story. Um, if you read in the uh, media about uh, about why companies fail, you will hear everywhere you go. There's a shortage of capital for startup companies. Companies fail because they can't raise money. There is no money available for them. To that, I say, baloney. There is all the money that's necessary for startup companies that's out there. Who are the press reporters interviewing when they, when they come up with the story that, uh, that companies fail because they, uh, because they can't raise money? Entrepreneurs who couldn't execute raised a little money and couldn't raise more money because they couldn't execute. It's about execution, not about capital. Companies that can execute can raise more capital. We've looked at the number of investments that we've missed uh, of successful companies. It's a tiny fraction. So we tend to invest in the companies that can execute and reporters tend to interview companies that ran out of money that couldn't execute. So it's all about execution. It's not all about raising money. Um, so um, I'll get off my soap, soapbox and uh, stop preaching and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what we're looking for in fundable companies. The first two items are the most important. Now, would we like to invest in a CEO who's already started a company and been successful or even failed? Yes, but we don't run into that very often. Most of the time we're investing in first-time entrepreneurs. For first-time entrepreneurs, integrity, coachability, and vertical experience is really, really important. Why vertical? Well, we don't tend to invest in farmers starting software companies or software code writers starting farms. We tend to invest in companies that know, in, in entrepreneurs that know something about the business vertical, and then they have to be coachable, and they have to be, have integrity. There's no such thing as a little white lie if you're an entrepreneur and I'm a potential investor. If you say that you uh, tended, uh, no, that you graduated from the London School of Economics, and I discover that you only attended uh, you're a history. I'm out of here. I'm gone. Because then I never know whether, if you've told me a little white lie, I never know the next financial report. Is this full of little white lies or the next milestone report? Did he really accomplish that? So there's always, you've, you've created doubt. I don't need to deal with that doubt. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next company and look for another company to invest in. Coachability. Um, we're investing time and money in, in portfolio companies. If we're going to invest time, we want to invest it in companies where the CEO actually wants to listen to us. So CEO seeking our advice and counsel, that doesn't mean you have to be coachable to be a successful entrepreneur. It just means you have to be coachable to get me to invest in your company. 
because I don't want to spend time with entrepreneurs who really don't want me to be there. I want to spend time with entrepreneurs who are looking for smart money, not dumb money. Um, so size of the opportunity, I think we've already covered that. Um, it does seem unusual to say we're looking for companies with large niche markets. I think that means large, large enough markets where the company can be pretty successful and operate under the radar. But it, niche markets means it's not dominated by uh, somebody like Microsoft. So uh, high gross margins are really important to us because we'd like to grow on our own generated cash. Uh, software companies have 90 plus percent so, uh, gross margins. They can grow very rapidly with self-generated cash. <coughs> Grocery stores with 10% gross margins, every time they want to build a new, uh, a new store, they have to go to the bank and, and raise a whole bunch more capital. So uh, we're looking for high gross margin uh, ventures. Can you ask you how, how big should the addressable market be then if uh, a business is uh, I think that that's a really good question. The question is how big should the addressable market is? The addressable market is assuming a company had 100% market share, uh, how big would that market be? So everybody that could ever want to buy that product is, is buying that product. How big was that market? Uh, I would say that the market has to be uh, more than 100 million, maybe more than 200 million dollars. Uh, we'd like to operate, it'd be really nice if it was a billion dollar market, uh, or at least 500 million. If, if, if we could operate at less than 10% market share uh, and have a significant position with maybe $20 million in revenues, that'd be a nice space. So that says a $200 million market. Um, what's dangerous is um, to go into a, a market with a company Assuming that they can get to $20 million in revenues in, let's say, five years, but it's only a $30 million market, the competitors in that marketplace are going to not going to allow that company to get to $20 million in revenues without significant cost uh, advertising, all kinds of, of competitive issues that, would, that the competitors will try to keep the target company from achieving those objectives. So, We'd like to have significant market share or significant revenues without having dominating market share, uh, just because it's it's easier to uh, to accomplish that mission uh, in that kind of a competitive marketplace. Um, uh, technology is a must-have. It's we have to have intellectual property of some form, trade secrets, patents. There has to be a competitive advantage such that. Two weeks after we introduce your first product, a bigger, richer uh, competitor can't reverse engineer your product and, um, and come out and compete with you in the marketplace. So we want there to be some product differentiation uh, that's uh, protectable. Uh, it's hard for us to put a big price tag on that as investors because we can't afford to defend it. You know, if uh, Microsoft decides to infringe, and we sue them. Uh, we may get a nice settlement, but I'll be dead before it settles. So it's not very interesting to me. It takes a long time and a lot of money uh, to settle any of these things in court. So uh, we, it's a box we have to check. Yes, this company has a uh, competitive advantage that will likely keep um, uh, reputable uh, competitors out of the marketplace. Um, I would say this about intellectual property. It has much greater value at exit than it does when we invest. Because if Microsoft infringes on a patent that has been acquired by Cisco buying our company, Cisco will defend themselves. They have the money and the resources to do that. So intellectual property probably has greater value at exit than it does at uh, investment. Um, we're, uh, we need to talk to customers before we make an investment is, as angel investors. I, I told you on the very first slide that an angels tend to engage when, when the company begins to have revenues. 
And that's because if there are 100 entrepreneurs in a room and we say, who's got a killer application? 100 hands go up. And if we ask each of those entrepreneurs to bring a customer, we ask the customers how many of these entrepreneurs have uh, a killer application, about 20% of the hands will go up. So we have to talk to the customers. We want to talk to users. Is this a must have or a nice to have? Is this a killer application or not? Will the dogs eat the dog food? That, that's what we investors want to validate by talking to potential uh, buyers of the product. Um, there are some issues uh, even with respect to the, the amount of subsequent funding that's required. Um, I look very carefully at this these days because companies that are going to require uh, $10 million or $20 million to be successful, uh, I'm very concerned about whether they're going to be able to raise that or not. So one of my personal strategies is I like to invest in deals that uh, do not require more money than angels are likely to be able to put in the company in two or three rounds of funding. I am less likely to invest in a deal that will require venture capital these days because venture capital firms are dwindling. They're investing in narrower niches of companies. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, if I run into an opportunity that's mainstream for several VCs that I know, that I might not invest in it. But I'm, most of my portfolio companies will be companies that won't require venture capital to, to get to an exit. Uh, so let's look at a couple of typical angel deals. Some of this is uh, repetitive, so I'll go over it pretty quickly. Um, uh, we are looking for companies with a, uh, for, uh, we want to build a functional board of directors. This is sometimes scary to entrepreneurs who uh, understand that uh, now they may actually have a boss called the board of directors. We may not control the board, but we don't want them to control it either. So we're looking for a relatively independent uh, board of directors. Um, I think I've touched on uh, most of this. We do look for companies that can have a M&A uh, opportunity mm -hmm. within, uh, within five years or so. Uh, I think I touched on uh, the issue of an unfair competitive advantage. Um, oh, we are looking for markets that are rather fractured. Uh, it's delightful to see a product in a relatively large marketplace where there aren't any big competitors and, uh, uh, and the Competitors that are there tend to have lower technology than the company that we're bringing to the market. Um, we're looking for deals that we can get a 10 or 20 or 30x out of. Uh, we'd like for the entrepreneur to be rather reasonable on terms and flexible on valuation. Um, and as I said, we really do want to uh, help the entrepreneur build a successful board. Um, some of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make, in my opinion, uh, is they take too much dumb money at too high a valuation. That may not affect them immediately, but eventually if they have to raise more capital, uh, it will affect them. And somebody asked me earlier about crowdfunding. That's why I'm skeptical about crowdfunding, crowdfunded companies for uh, angel and venture, uh, for companies that will need angel or venture capital. I'm not sure that sophisticated investors will, will invest behind the crowd. I won't, and I think a lot of other people share their concern about having a thousands, uh, a thousand uh, unsophisticated investors who are all already invested in this portfolio company. So uh, for me, uh, uh, taking dumb money from lots of investors is a mistake that entrepreneurs make. When I hear business plans from entrepreneurs, they always want to talk about the product and technology, and they never want to talk about the business. They want to talk about sales and marketing and customers and capital and finance. And when we hear pitches from entrepreneurs, we want to hear pitches for businesses, not pitches for products and technology. Um, 
I, uh, I often hear pitches where the entrepreneur uh, totally uh, misses what the addressable market is. I'll give you a ridiculous example. So let's say that you're in the sheepskin seat cover business. That's hard to say if you've had a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> but I did get through it that time. Um, and your um, and the entrepreneur tells you that the market size is two hundred billion dollars. Well, that's the size of the automotive marketplace. That's not the size of the uh, aftermarket seat cover business. So, and entrepreneurs make that mistake all the time. Uh, they tell us uh, they've got a, a new battery for a, a pacemaker and the size of the market is $4 billion, which is the size of the pace market, maker marketplace. So entrepreneurs need to understand and define for investors what their addressable marketplace is. Another mistake that entrepreneurs make is um, they ballpark their revenues by saying, I've got a $300 million marketplace, and after year one, I'm going to have 1% of the market as my and my revenues. You know, I can make that calculation too. 1% of 300 million is not that tough a calculation. Uh, so give me more to work with than that. Let's do a bottom-up analysis of, of what your revenues are going to be. Just don't tell me that after five years you're going to have 4% market share and here's the size of the market and think that you've told me anything useful about the revenues of your company. Finally, uh, I think first mover advantage is overstated and overrated. Uh, anybody ever hear of Alta Vista? Wonder where they went. <laughs> uh, first mover in the search engine marketplace. And we can name, you know, how about MySpace? Oh, there's a, another major winner. Uh, you know, we can list all kinds of first movers. And first movers have struggle. They have to do missionary sales. They have to not only find customers, but teach them how to use the product. And second or third or fourth movers in the space are much more likely to be able to dominate. So I'm not saying that first mover advantage is never important. I'm saying be very careful about using the first mover advantage as, uh, as competitive in this marketplace. So. Remember that we investors are betting on the jockey, not on the horse. We're looking for companies with large opportunities, and we need them to be, uh, have a competitive advantage, and we're skeptical if they're going to need a lot of capital to get where they're going. Any questions about fundable companies? I have one. Yep. Okay, so we've got a company, it's got a potential to grow at this rate. And the CEO has the skills and experience to, to grow the company at this rate. Isn't it in everybody's best interest from a net worth perspective of the CEO, from the investment perspective, to find somebody who has the skills and experience to grow the company at this rate, to make sure it does grow at this rate? So we don't want the opportunity to be limited by the skills and experiences of the entrepreneur. When the opportunity exceed the opportunity exceeds the growth rate of the skills and experiences of the entrepreneur, it's time for the entrepreneur and the investors to go find somebody who has already run a hundred million dollar company to step in and run this, this company. That's why I had that. So how emotional is that? Oh very. That's why you have the discussion at during due diligence before we ever invest. We usually ask the entrepreneur, how big a company have you run? Uh, oh, well, I've never run a company before. How big a division? Well, I've supervised 10 people in a research lab. Well, what skills does that give you for running a $10 million company? Well, maybe it doesn't give me any. You know, is being successful at this company important to you? Yes. Okay, well, let's talk about what milestones we think you can accomplish, and then it'll be important for, and at what point it'll be important for you and us to pick somebody to drive this company forward and be successful. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. About this market size, what about if the market is really small, but it's grow growing really rapidly, like 50% a year? I, I found it interesting also because it's really open market and not very many players yet in the market. Yeah, I, I'm not suggesting that that's not a good opportunity. Um, it means you have to do even more due diligence, though, because now you have to do some due diligence on the growth rate of the marketplace. And there, but there are usually some really good studies, Juniper and other people who do uh, emerging uh, measure emerging markets. So you can usually find some good information about that. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. 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 I agree, but very often we have the case that the original uh, CEO is an innovator, a developer, and he should uh, step aside and give room to a professional CEO to put the company to the world markets. And the crucial question is how to give up, to, to give room professionals as leaders, and then go to what you do the best innovations. Yeah, that often happens when you're, when you're dealing with a university or a public laboratory uh, innovators. Um, and I think the, the best, I mean, it's an it's a age-old problem. Uh, oftentimes you're dealing with somebody that's got three PhDs and has this godlike image, so running a company couldn't be very difficult. After all, I, I invented a cure for cancer. Um, but I think what we usually do in that case is we ask for commitment. You want to run the company, you let go of your tenured position at the university. What? <laughs> You mean I'm going to give up my golden parachute over here? Uh, so that's the sort of commitment that we're looking for from all entrepreneurs, whether they're a university professor or whatever. And that's how we often address the issue is if you're going to run the company, you got to have both feet in, all your personal net worth, and uh, give up all your other positions. And frankly, we very seldom run into people who are actually willing to do that. So. Then we talk about other roles, CTO, company guru, some kind of another role that this founder inventor could take place because actually the customers want to hear from the guru. Where's the company going from here? What product innovations do we see? You know, what additional protections will we have for this technology down the road? So the customers actually want, to want, want that relationship. So we'd like to have that relationship too. Yes, sir. I'm going to have somebody, some university professor, stand up and throw something at me soon. So I have to be a little careful with what I say. But I know you're not a university professor. Do you have any insight if we take other CEO into the company? What should be the right size of the owners for the new management? You know, that's a really market sensitive thing. Um, in good times, especially in Silicon Valley, when uh, venture capital is going well, and there's lots of startups, and there's lots of capital chasing uh, new companies, uh, it can be pretty expensive, uh, maybe even as much as 10% for a hired gun, uh, it, maybe even more. Uh, in normal times, uh, you know, 5% uh, might be uh, more, maybe even 4% might be a more reasonable number. I don't think there's a absolute fixed number. I think also you have to look at the skill sets. If this, if this uh, hired gun has done it several times before, they're obviously more valuable than if they run a big division in a, in a, a company that's right in this business vertical. So I don't think there's a right answer, but you're gonna have to give them something to, to keep them motivated, keep their feet to the fire. You want, the, you want them to be successful. Yes, sir. What's your experience of the angel investors themselves becoming acting this or that in the company? Does that ever work? Yeah, well, Bill Gates did it. You know, Steve Jobs, oh, wait a minute, he got fired once. <laughs> um, Steve Jobs did it and then did it again. Um, so I've had, I've had several occasions where the CEO went all the way to exit, but uh, just as many occasions when we've hired, uh, had to hire somebody. I think if you ask um, a room full of VCs, uh, how many of you uh, uh, fired the entrepreneur and replaced him with a hired CEO at exactly the right time? Nobody will raise their hand. 
How many six months earlier? Nobody will raise their hand. How many six months late? Everybody raises their hand. <laughs> so it takes time. It's painful. Uh, we'd like not to do it, but uh, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, it's in the best interest of our investors, or us as investors, or the company. And the that's why we was, do it. Uh, if, how was it with, if the business angel steps in? As a, as oh, was that the question? I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, um, I would say, in general, um, that doesn't happen, but once in a while, that it's the right person for the job. I, I know of several uh, instances where that, that was the right person. Um, I don't think we want to build an angel group around uh, entrepreneurs who are looking for their next gig. Uh, but once in a while, you, the, a company comes along and you know you're the perfect person to run it. So it happens, but it's not a it's not a high fraction of our investments. Yes, sir. I still have one uh, comment on that or or question uh, related to that. Anderson Horowitz, uh, right? Is that correct name? They raised two billion dollars on the premise that um, they will poach the founder uh, CEO. They will poach and then build the company further. That was their premise, and then they got two billion dollars as a fund. Yep. What do, you, what do you think about? It? Well, I. So how many investments are they going to make? So maybe uh, less than a million dollars, and so they got to make two thousand investments. So how much coaching can they do? Not very much. It, I mean, two billion dollars divided by a million is a, a lot of companies that they're planning on. But so I think it's a flawed strategy. Right. Uh, they don't have that much time. It's like uh, Y Combinator is, you know. Graham brings in 60 new companies a year. How much time does he actually have to spend with those companies? It's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. But he has a damn good network. So when he gives you advice, it's good advice, but he's not giving you advice very often. So anyway, uh, there's some, there's, you have to explore the model. Um, this is the angel investing process. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but deal flow comes over the transom we don't necessarily encourage, no, let me put it another way. We encourage all entrepreneurs to apply, apply for funding from most of our groups in the US, not just people we know. They don't have to know a member to get uh, to, get, to be looked at. Um, so if 100% of the deals, whether it's 100 or 30, but so 100% uh, uh, of the deals come over the transom and, we usually have some kind of a pre-screening process. That means that the company uh, meets our criteria for investment. So we say we're looking for uh, uh, high growth companies and somebody sends a plan in that if we give them a million dollars in, in 10 years, they'll have $2 million in revenues. Well, that probably doesn't meet our criteria for investment. Or maybe they've got this really exciting opportunity as a pornographic website. Well, maybe that doesn't meet our criteria for investment. So the first cut we make is that companies don't meet what we've established as our criteria for investment. And most angel groups have written down what they're, at what stage of development, how much money, at what valuation, in what business sectors, what business spec sectors they won't invest in. Uh, a lot of a lot of angels don't invest in life science areas uh, because you know it's uh, it's not an area they have a lot of familiarity with. So that cuts out about half of the deals. Then uh, we usually have a presentation to some or all of the members called screening, and the object of the game is to get a few members to raise their hand and say they would like to do some due diligence on this deal. So. Um, and about 20% of the total deals sort of get through that process. And then uh, we start the due diligence and usually it's three to six or four to six members who, who uh, do, the, do the due diligence and about half of those uh, deals get thrown out, some kind of a problem we find in due diligence. And then they probably make some kind of a investment presentation after the due diligence, and the due diligence could take uh, a couple of months. Um, and then probably half of those 
deals get funded. So for most groups, this funded companies is between one and 5% of deals uh, that they see. If it's 5%, it usually means there's come some kind of another screen before on the top. What other kind of screen? Well, let's say companies come out of accelerators. They're more fundable than companies that uh, come over the transom that have not had any coaching before. So if you only look at companies that come out of accelerators, you're probably going to find a, you're going to fund a higher fraction of them uh, than if you're only looking at companies that have never had any uh, mentoring or coaching before. So this number could vary quite a bit, uh, but it depends on the quality of the companies coming in at the top of the funnel. And that's really what we're dealing with is a, is a funnel of companies. Um, deal flows come from a lot of different sources, uh, but most groups in the U.S. Encourage unreferenced deals. Um, Can I ask you something about yeah. the deal flow? Yep. Uh, have you, do you recognize this problem that uh, you have a member <coughs> or, or some part of the members who are uh, who, who get in touch with new deals outside of your, your group and, and, and don't bring them into the group, thinking that this this they want to keep from for themselves and not share with the others. Um, are they really members of the group? Um, I would ask that question of them. Um, we don't, for more, more uh, mature, sophisticated groups, uh, we don't see that so much anymore. Um, they, the, the angels, if the angels are using you as an angel group only to see deals that they want to go and do by themselves, uh, they're they're not welcome to be members of groups that I'm a member of. Um, so it depends on, you know, if, if uh, we also see members of angel groups who are soliciting business from uh, deal flow, uh, attorney services or accounting services, and the only reason they're a member of the group is to solicit business, even from other members. Uh, uh, private wealth management or something like that uh, we have a specific document membership uh, agreement that our members sign that says they're not going to steal deals and they're not going to solicit either members or submitting companies for business that's not why we're getting together we're Another getting question is that do you, do you uh, have you have you found a problem in, in the entrepreneur saying that you can be an investor in my company, but your friend cannot. And how do you deal with that? Well, I think I would do some work on that. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I, that very seldom has happened to me. Uh, so I would want to know why. I would uh, explore that. Um, why would an entrepreneur say that? Um, would it be because they were had a previous bad experience with that individual? I, I don't know. Um, but, but you don't have any rule in your group saying that uh, all or none, all that want to be in that uh, case. I am trying to think of an example where an investor was excluded at the request of the entrepreneur. I'm sure it has happened, but it's very, very rare, very rare that I have seen that. Um, I would have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. Any other questions? Uh, you can even have interns do your, uh, your uh, pre-screening. In fact, interns, if, they're tra if trained right, can be great choices for coaching uh, entrepreneurs in their presentations. So there, there's a lot of use of interns in this managing of deal flow. Um, this is sort of the criteria of, of investment that most angel groups have, uh, geography, business sectors, and actually it could be business sectors not of interest. It's easier for me to define the deals I'm not interested in than the deals I'm interested in. So that's another alternative there. Um, if we usually uh, cap the amount of money that we're interested in investing to preclude 
uh, entrepreneurs coming to us who need 10 million bucks or something that's obviously out of the range of what angels would, uh, would usually do. Uh, we may have other uh, criteria, special business segments or, or uh, stages of development that are of, of particular interest to us. Um, screening is usually done by members uh, who are trying to determine uh, how to, if the deal is interesting, and how to move forward into a due diligence phase. Um, due diligence can take two to three months, and the object of due diligence, uh, we're going to spend some time after lunch on this so I don't have to spend very much time here, but it's basically to get the due diligence team to the point that they're interested in writing a check. If nobody from the due diligence is inter team is interested in writing a check, then it's doubtful that the rest of the members would uh, be interested in writing a check. Um, uh, the, the investment by the group is usually based on the do, work done by the due diligence team. And in some jurisdictions, you have to be a little careful about how you do this. We never make investment recommendations. We simply tell the story about the company. Here's the due diligence we did, and here's what we found out about the company. You make your own investment decision because we have this um, rules in our federal jurisdiction about, rec about what it takes for me to be qualified to make an investment recommendation to John, for example. Yeah? Uh, based on your knowledge and experience, how often do you see or see that the valuation is deal breaker? Um, well, well we addressed that very early, but there are entrepreneurs who read the Silicon Valley newspapers and think that all deals are going to be done at a $10 million pre-money valuation. And we simply tell them, uh, let's not start this discussion. Why don't you go talk to a bunch of other people and figure out what the value of your company is, and then come back, uh, and we'll talk about valuation. It never comes to the point where money is spent. So, no, usually don't get very far. I mean, if the company says it's worth $10 million and we say it's worth nothing, and we split the difference, it's still too high. So it doesn't help. <laughs> It doesn't help if it's way out of the picture. Um, syndication with other groups, now I have to, uh, I'm referring to co-investment with other angel organizations or other angel syndicates. So uh, to be successful in uh, convincing other angel organizations to invest with you, you have to move pretty quickly because, okay, now you've done a whole bunch of work. You're ready to write checks. The entrepreneur's ready to get to work. That's not a good time to encourage another group to start looking at a deal. So you've got to make other, if you think you're going to have to get co-investment from other angel groups, you're going to have to talk to them early. Uh, in the U.S., we have several uh, co-investment uh, agreements between multiple groups where they have phone conversations once a, once a month. What's a new deal you've got going in your area that might, uh, might use some additional funds from our group? Where are you at what stage? When will you be able to send us a due diligence book so we can look this deal over, make, we make a few phone calls to the entrepreneur? So um, getting other groups engaged early and providing them with uh, valuable due diligence documents is sort of a best practice when it comes to getting multiple groups to invest in the same deal. Yes? Uh, can you, in the U.S., uh, tie up this uh, uh, funding with some uh, public resources, like it's the case in Finland many times that uh, uh, if you can get public funding, then you get private funding? Um, let me, s I may uh, offend people in the audience by saying this, so uh, get your tomatoes ready. Um, I don't think the public sector is generally qualified to make investments. There may be exceptions to that, but I think it should be the other way around. I think that private investors should be making the decisions and the public investors should invest alongside. Now, there are some very qualified public sector investors in a few jurisdictions. There are actually some really good ones in New Zealand. 
but in fact, they follow the Scottish model of co-investing alongside, even though I think they're highly qualified, they invest alongside private investors. So um, it depends on the kind of culture you're trying to build and the level of engagement you want from your private investors. So if the private investors have to do the due diligence, uh, they're going to be pretty engaged in this deal. Um, so I, I mean, it could be a lot of cultural differences here. Um, in the U.S., we see some co-investment co by states, but there is, at this point, no federal co-investment at all. Um, there, there are some extension of federal research monies, but that requires some match, but it's usually earlier than angels are usually involved. And it's a tiny bit of, I mean, if angels are investing, angels are investing 20 or 25 times as much money as the feds are in uh, early stage ventures. So it's a tiny fraction of deals that are getting a federal match. But you can maybe get some tax reliefs on your investments. Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of tax relief schemes all over the world uh, for uh, uh, tax credits against, uh, for angel investments. I think, if anything, there's probably increasing in interest around the world in, in tax credits. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a quick, uh, this is going to be discussed Friday with the Prime Minister, so if you could, there's a, quite an important few things there in the end, so if you could just head over that part. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, so, let's quick um, see, how much time do we have? Well, when do people really need to leave? We have a lunch with PVC, quarter past 12. Okay. So we got 20 minutes max. Yeah, and if you still want to sign up for the due diligence event, just raise your hand afterwards. So, so I've got about uh, I've got about 20 minutes of presentation, but I'll I'll actually move through. Uh, I, I've actually talked to you about models of angel organizations. There there are two considerations. The are you going to have a fund where you pool your money in advance, and we talked about that earlier today. Or are you going to have a syndicate where everybody makes up their own mind about writing a check? The other part of the matrix is, are you going to be run by a manager? And what is their role going to be? Are they going to make investment decisions or administrative decisions for the group? Or are you going to be run by uh, uh, um, the members, where the members are making the policy decisions and the investment decisions uh, for the organization? And that's, those are basically the decisions that, that have to be made when you're designing an angel organization. Um, I've defined funds and networks, and remember that network is the same as a syndicate. And most funds, but not all, most funds are manager-managed, are, are and uh, syndicates can be either. Uh, in fact, both can be either this day. When I made this chart, there weren't many member-managed angel funds, and now there are. So uh, this chart needs some revision. I, I think I've told you that we pool money in advance for a fund, and then we vote. We screen and scrub a deal, and then we vote. If we get 51%, we make the investment. Um, yeah, a network, we screen and scrub deals together, and then we write our own individual checks, as we've already described. Um, so let me just cover, uh, I think that, I, as I mentioned, I think funds are a bit more recession proof than networks are. Um, I think the problem sometimes uh, with networks is um, that, are, that are member managed is succession. You've got a really enthusiastic leader the first year and the second year, and the third year, and then they get tired and burned out, and then nobody wants to pick up the slack after that. So that's one of the problems with, um, with uh, manager-led uh, organizations. Um, and that's really here. Uh, Member-led organizations, a leadership succession uh, can be a problem. I'm just trying to sort of highlight some of the issues of of angel organization. There, there's, um, there, um, especially with angel funds, I want to stress the fact that 
it's not just the fund putting money in. So let's say we've pooled our money in advance, we have an angel fund, and we like a deal, and the proposal is that we invest 200 euros, 200,000 euros in this company, and we vote and we get uh, over half of the members agree to, that's usually not the end of it. Then we have several members in the room that say, ooh, I really like that deal too, so I'm gonna write a check too. So we usually get another 200,000 euros in side-by-side -side investing or sidecar investing by members who are investing in that deal as well. So we don't exclude mem individual membership investing in any deal we look at as part of a fund. In fact, we have deals where the fund votes down an opportunity and some members still step to the plate and write a check. Uh, and that's fine because they've all sort of gone through the process together and then they make a decision. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I, I want to move on to sort of co-investment and syndication and spend uh, about 10 minutes on this uh, before we, we uh, uh, move to lunch. So there, the, the tr there's a trend towards angel-only deals. That means deals that angel, angels have deep enough pockets to fund. And generally that's less than uh, a couple million dollars or a couple, well, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, or a couple, mi a couple uh, million euros uh, to get the company to either positive cash flow and exits. Um, VC returns are low. VCs have not been successful in raising new funds. There are, uh, in the U.S. still, maybe uh, seven or 800 VC firms. The number of them making new investments is about half of that. They still exist. They're managing portfolio companies. They're not making new investments. So uh, follow-on funding by venture capital has become a problem, and many of us who are angels have been looking for deals that angels can get to uh, an exit, um, and it has driven angels to look for more angel money to fund deals. The formation of the Angel Capital Association in the U.S. is a membership organization for angel groups. So our leaders go to meetings of uh, other angel groups from around the country, and that helps build trust and it helps encourage uh, syndicate or uh, co-investment by multiple funds. Um, so the, both on the demand side and the supply side, we've had some trends that are resulting in two-thirds of U.S. deals now being funded by multiple groups. Um, I was actually, I just saw that data last month, um, I was actually quite surprised to uh, see that that high a fraction of U.S. deals uh, was being uh, co-invested on by multiple angel groups. I thought that was a, uh, that was a really, in fact, I called up the presenter who had collected that data for the Angel Capital Association. I actually called him up and talked about it because I actually thought there was a mistake in the slide. Um, I was really convinced that it wasn't true, but I was, I was shown that uh, they have the data to support that. So uh, that's a that's a interesting interesting <coughs> trend going on in the U.S. Syndication and co-investment in the U.S. Uh, have similar definitions. Uh, I understand uh, the <coughs> that as I've said all morning, a syndication to you um, is the same as a syndicate to you is the same as an uh, a network for us, and I think we now sort of get that. Um, I, I already showed you this data, the, the, about two-thirds of angel rounds are uh, uh, co-invested by multiple deals. We cooperate on due diligence, so the local group shares a due diligence book with um, any other angel group that's interested in funding the deal. Um, the local group, which is usually the lead investor, negotiates a single term sheet, and the rest of us who are interested in investing in that deal, it becomes a take it or leave it situation. 
we either like the deal and like the term sheet or we don't invest. Yes? Yes. I would like to ask about the kind of the leader, leadership on the, uh, or who is really responsible of getting the round done. That, that you know, the entrepreneur comes to me and says, I need 700,000 and then our group only has 250. Then whose responsibility is really to sell it for? Um, I, we try to encourage the entrepreneur and the lead investor to take the deal to other groups to try to fill in this round. So uh, many times the entrepreneur is making the pitch, but the deal comes recommended by the local group. Maybe for some reason the lead investor cannot accompany the entrepreneur, but the other group knows that the group has made a dollar commitment and is willing to share due diligence. Um, so that knowledge goes with the entrepreneur. But we'd actually rather have the lead investor go along and be the lead investor for uh, the entire round. Um, once in a while, the local group would say, we want to fund this deal, maybe, but we recognize this other group uh, has more uh, sophisticated members in this business sector and maybe we will actually quietly go into that other group with the knowledge of the members and say we really like this deal w would, would you take a look at it and consider being the lead investor so once in a while we actually go to another group and say we think you're more qualified to lead this round um, we're willing to put so much money in but we think you're the, the best person for the job on this I would say that probably happens, you know, 25% of the time uh, that we would go to another group and look for a lead investor. Not, not surely not a majority, but it happens, and I think it's a good practice. Go find the best possible person who could invest in this deal. Could be the the lead investor representing all the investors in this round. Any other questions? And the cooperation between the groups, it's just a free willing, you know, there is no compensation of a finder's fee or, or a we are managing this or, or we did the, the due diligence. Everything is just uh, based on that kind of... Yeah, yeah, absolutely no finder's fee. And the, the, the reason that there is cooperation is that the other group will help us fund this deal and we're expected then to have our doors open the next time they have a deal that they need to top off. Now, we're making no commitment. We may look at three or four of their deals before we find one that we want to invest in. So we're making a commitment to look at their deals. We're not making a commitment to invest in their deals. Of course, after five years, if they invested in three of ours and we never invested in any of theirs, they uh, may become a little skeptical about how, how good of partners we are. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally, I would say it's a pretty open relationship, and we, we all understand mm -hmm. that working with one term sheet is in everybody's best interest. So um, there's too many deals out there. The object of the game is to get a lot of deals done, give everybody a chance to have a diversified portfolio. So stealing deals only uh, makes enemies and means that I'm not going to get to share, if I steal a deal, I'm probably not going to see any of your deals in the future. So in the long term, it's just not good practice. Uh, yes, sir? What's your view, uh, what's the optimal size of, of uh, well, uh, the age of the company? Uh, uh, oh, a what optimal size of a uh, <coughs> well-run angel group? Um, I think there's a minimum and a maximum. and. Uh, there are a lot of really highly functional groups in the middle, and the minimum is somewhere in the 30 range, 25 to 30 range. Um, just with all the stuff you got to do and the, the level of business vertical expertise you'd like to have in the group, uh, 25 or 30 is sort of the minimum. When it gets over 100, then people don't know each other, uh, so you're trying to build trust and co-investment and syndication, and so. Um, there are a few groups bigger than 100, but we've often seen groups split off when they get over 100 and start two 50-person groups, um, maybe by geography or business vertical, maybe some software guys only or life science guys split off, um, or maybe this part of town 
you know, north part of town has one angel group and the south part of town has another angel group and you look at some of the same deals together. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily competitive, but it just makes it a little easier for uh, for everybody to go to meetings, etc. Yes, sir. General type of question. How much money, how much weight or value your business angels should keep to so called external award? Just now we have a business company who is collecting money and has won the best women uh, innovation award within Europe and has got the innovation award in Finland and uh, was included to the European Red Herring list of 100. So, what is the value? To I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, I think uh, we we'll addressed the evaluation in a separate work workshop. So, if we just so it's about the question is about the valuation of the deal. Mm -hmm. Yes, if if some company, target company, has received oh. different types of external rewards, they, they've already received funding at a higher value at a high valuation. A valuation you think is too high? The the recognition awards. Awards. Oh, recognition. Okay. Uh, you know, sometimes that and a uh, dollar will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm skeptical of the... I mean, I think it gets your attention and you like to look at those kinds of companies. I actually encourage... Don't tell Ernst & Young. Uh, I encourage my portfolio companies not to apply for them. It's a major distraction of their time to uh, get so involved in in these ego contests. I want them to. I want revenues. I don't want prizes. But in addition, nice to know they have value as a promotional vehicle. Yeah, I mean, there's value, and I and I not you know does that then make the company three times higher valuation when I invest? I then. <laughs> I think I think we'll continue the valuation discussion at the valuation work. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if uh, there are still some question about syndication, I if Eve on the European Decent Angels Network of the Year, so <laughs> excellent <laughs> award. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I have, I have no, no further comments. <laughs> I have one, one question. Yeah. So, uh, first, could you could you shortly uh, say what's the difference in in group investing and syndication? And, and second question, I, I would address that at the same time. If, if we have this group of 150 members now in Shiva, uh, should we make an internal policy that everybody who's, who finds a deal tells the entrepreneur to put in the deal in our network, uh, on our web page, apply for for the money through through the web page, or how should we encourage this uh, syndication? So. Um the, well, let me answer the second question first. I think um, I, I think the it becomes a a bit of a group and a personal decision as to how you address uh, companies that approach you as individuals. I'm very comfortable referring individual entrepreneurs to angel group. Um, but I think a lot of it sometimes has to deal with the confidence that the individual investor has in the angel organization. Um, but I think as time goes on, uh, you will find that uh, members value the skill sets of the group as a whole and will, will send uh, their, their potential deals to the to FIBAN for for due diligence and the negotiating in terms sheet, doing the deal, um, but I don't I don't know how long that will take. Um, uh, but I but I've seen it happen in other areas where groups say, you know, I just actually like enjoying, I like investing through this group, so I'm going to refer all my deals to this group, and I hope that happens to you know Feban pretty quickly. As far as investing as a group versus a syndicate, I think our definition of a network is the same as your definition of a syndicate. <coughs> so, um, uh, and the word, if you look up the word syndication and co-investment in the dictionary, you know, they say the same thing. So, it's just how we're using those words. And what I'm trying to 
use here is to not confuse you too much with the fact that you call something a syndicate and I call it a network, but when we're talking about co-investment or multiple groups investing in a deal, it's different than everybody within a group having an opportunity to invest. Okay, in. so what, what I meant to was that uh, group investing, I, I refer to that as, as uh, many angels investing in the same deal, with what, with, but without any coordination. Mm. Well, um, I think, again, there's a maturity issue. And I think as you do more deals together, um, it will be in everybody's best interest that you're um, more coordinated than you are right now. Um, uh, I don't know whether now you're investing under under different term sheets or the same term sheets. Uh, I think that's pretty dangerous. Eventually the same. Yeah, okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so I only got a couple more slides here. Um, the trend for co-investment among groups in the U.S. Uh, is growing pretty rapidly. As I've said before, local groups tend to lead the deals. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of having a, a single deal lead and a single term sheet. Um, I, I've shown you these two slides before. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about uh, Kiwi Angel Groups. Um, their their uh, land mass and population is pretty similar to that of Finland. They've got 14 angel groups spread all over the country. Um, and they're about as active as a community as Boston is that has a population of about 3.6 million. So uh, it's pretty active communicate. And, and they syndicate half of their deals. By syndication, I mean co-investment with other groups. They co-invest with other groups in half of their deals. So this trend of the U.S. going above 50% for the first time this past year in co-investment by groups um, is not just happening in the U.S., it's also happening uh, in New Zealand. Um, uh, and, and I think that's probably a good place to stop this morning. Um, I got a couple other slides, but I don't think they're particularly uh, germane. So, uh, any other questions before we uh, quit? Excellent. Okay, turn it back over.